Hey guys, this is Dr. Joel with Metamersion.com and I'm super excited to bring you this video on the basic metabolic panel. This is the first half of a two-part series, so when you're done here, make sure you go check out the link for the other video, okay? In this video, I'm going to start with uh, the broad definition and introduction to the BMP, and then I'm going to give you the fish bone and some mnemonics to help you remember it, and then we're going to go through the first couple of tests within the BMP, okay? All right, so the BMP, the basic metabolic panel, is high yield. How high yield? Five out of five, baby. You got to know it. Why do you got to know it? Because it is so stinking common. You are going to order BMPs until your fingers turn blue. That's what it seems like sometimes anyway. So definitely pay attention to this lecture. In other countries, other than uh, the U.S., you might also hear it called a Chem 7 or an SMA7. That's fine, tomato, tomato, it's all the same thing. Um, the BMP is a simpler version of the CMP, which is the Comprehensive Metabolic Panel, and it includes seven extra tests. So a total of 14 tests, which includes tests for the liver and other electrolytes. If you need to learn more about that, here's a link for you. What makes the BMP so awesome is that it is the results come back really quick and it gives you a broad overview of very useful information about fluid and electrolyte status and um, a lot of other things from which we can make inferences or guide our diagnoses um, for further testing. So it's kind of like the initial test um, and that with the clinical picture guides you in other directions. It gives you good information on water status, it, diabetes, congestive heart failure, renal disease, liver disease, and even medication or drug overdoses. In a standard BMP, there are seven tests. Four of those are electrolytes. Those tests include the sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarbonate. The last three are not electrolytes, but are equally important. Next up is the discussion of the fishbone. You draw out a BMP fishbone like so. Lines, lines, lines. Basically, it looks like a fish, right? And then you add it on the tests. Sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarb, BUN, creatinine, and glucose. Okay, but you're probably thinking, great, how am I going to remember this? Well, that's part of the reason why I colored it this way. Sodium, potassium are green. They are cations. Red is for the anions. Yellow is looking at the renal system for urine. And then um, black is glucose. Let's make it a mnemonic. Way easier to remember mnemonics. Okay, so what does sodium chloride equal? It equals table salt. Okay, so you've got a salty bun and a pot for potassium, a pot of hot coffee with cream and sugar. It's your breakfast. It's what you have every day before you go to school, right? A salty bun with a pot of hot coffee with cream and sugar. Easy. You got it. Go forth and kick butt. Okay, let's move on to the individual components of a BMP, starting with sodium. So first off, normal values, 135 to 145 millimoles per liter or milliequivalents per liter, depending on uh, what country you're in, you, you might have a preference for one or the other. Remember 3.5 and 4.5, as in 135 to 145, because 3.5 and 4.5 are going to be common numbers with potassium as well. So that will kind of help you remember normal values. Um, whenever you're thinking about sodium problems, try to think about it as a sodium and water problem, or at least look at it from both both sides, because where one goes, the other often follows. Also, it's sometimes it's difficult to say, uh, is this problem too much water, or is this a problem of not enough salt, or not enough sodium? Um, so, so you kind of need to think of the two of them together. Excessively low sodium is called hyponatremia, and excessively high sodium, or ab above the limit of normal, is called hypernatremia. A few words on the physiology of sodium. We get all of our sodium through our diet in the form of salt. In fact, we get 
probably way too much sodium. You're going to find that your counseling patients sometimes that they need to cut back on the amount of sodium that they're taking in, especially people with problems with edema or uh, congestive heart failure. There's two main regulating pathways for um, sodium in our bodies, and that's the vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone, ADH, um, which is a hormone that regulates salt and water uh, concentration in the urine, and also the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which is a multi-organ system, and both of these are out of the scope of this lecture. If you want to learn about them, you can click on the link. Sodium is very important, mostly for osmoregulation, or the balance of fluids between com compartments in the body. Also very important for the proper function of neurons and anything that uses the sodium potassium pump. So now for the common causes of abnormal values. And I'm gonna start with hyponatremia. Look, hyponatremia or hypernatremia, sodium, water problems, it's a big deal and clinically challenging. Okay, so no problem. Here's a link, the workup and management of sodium abnormalities so that you can review and be a little bit smarter if it happens to you clinically. So hyponatremia, common causes, things that I've seen, things that I read about. Syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, SIADH, very common. You're going to see it a lot. Um, adrenal insufficiency can cause problems with hormones that thus affect the kidneys and therefore affect sodium. Kidney disease, all kinds of kidney disease can mess with the management of sodium. But here's something that's a little bit more tricky. Why did I put heart failure and cirrhosis here? Why are those common causes of hyponatremia? Well, this goes back to what I said earlier about sodium and water. It's, is it not enough sodium or is it too much water? Well, in this case, um, you need to think about maybe too much water. What does that have to do with heart failure? Well, if your heart is failing, it is not providing enough blood pressure for the kidneys to uh, adequately filter or, or output uh, water or dilute urine. So, so you uh, retain water. Thus, you dilute the sodium and you get hyponatremia. Same thing with cirrhosis of the liver. Um, the liver does make, um, it does make hormones. Angiotensinogen is made in the liver, for example. And also, you can have restrictive blood problems with cirrhosis of the liver, both of which can cause kidney problems and therefore sodium problems. There you go. As for medications, you will often read about hydrochlorothiazide being a potential cause of hyponatremia, chronic morphine use, and even SSRIs can do it. As for hypernatremia, or too much sodium in the body, uh, I like to think of this as what would increase fluid loss, or what would make the body lose free water. Sweat can do this, excessive diarrhea can do this, Weeping burns, where you're evaporating a lot of water but retaining the ions. And um, osmotic diuretics, that's a good one, right? Because it osmotically pulls free water from the body while the machinery in the kidneys, the ion pumps, are still trying to retain the other ions. So it's just water pretty much pouring out of you and therefore concentrating the sodium. Hyperaldosteronism can do it. And diabetes insipidus can also do it. You're dumping water out, free water. Therefore, you concentrate the sodium and you get hypernatremia. Shifting over to the other positive cation potassium. Key points here. Um, normal values between 3.5 and 4.5 millimoles per liter. Remember how I said 3.5 and 4.5 are good numbers to remember? Well, that's because it helps you remember sodium and potassium. We've got a whole heck of a lot of potassium in our bodies, but it's locked intracellular, uh, intracell that's a good word to say, intracellularly, intracellularly. Um, excessively low potassium is called hypokalemia, and excessively high potassium is called hyperkalemia. And uh, as far as the physiology of potassium, I'm not trying to be comprehensive here at all, We've, like I said, we've got a whole bunch of it in our bodies. A grown male could have as much as 180 grams of total body potassium, but it's all locked intracellularly or inside the cells, okay? 
We consume plenty of potassium with every meal. The, the key is, is that we excrete a lot of potassium also. So the kidneys, kidneys are very, very efficient at, at helping us balance our potassium. What would cause large swings one way or the other in potassium? And the key here is, well, where is most of the potassium? It's in the cells. So if you get um, any kind of shift of the potassium out of the cells or into the cells, that's where you see the huge swings. Okay, what might cause that? Acidemia or alkalemia? Or, I'm sorry, al acidosis, same thing. Acidosis, alkalosis. Um, changes in the pH will make uh, so, uh, potassium go back and forth. Insulin, um, sugar load, catecholamines, temperature changes, things like that can cause the potassium to swing wildly back and forth into and out of the cells. Slower changes would be through the GI or renal system. So mm, first thing you should probably look at or think about is those large swing pathologies. As far as an important hormone, aldosterone is a very important hormone for the regulation of potassium. Okay, now for the common causes of abnormal values in potassium, starting first with hypokalemia. You really have to know, loop diuretics cause hypokalemia. If you're going to put somebody on a loop diuretic for any extended period of time at all, you have to supplement their potassium. You just have to know that. GI losses could be a cause of hypokalemia over a period of time, a lot of vomiting or chronic diarrhea. You could, you could lose a lot of potassium that way. Also, large surges in catecholamines. And I don't mean normal physiologic surges, but I mean like giving somebody catecholamine, giving somebody epinephrine if you're doing ACLS or trying to revive them. That can change the potassium in their body. Hyperaldosteronism can also do it. Aldosterone is a hormone that promotes the excretion of potassium from the kidneys and the retention of sodium. So it would make sense. Too much aldosterone would do that. Also, hypothermia can cause a hypokalemia. And this is, again, your cells taking up the potassium. And there's some there's some pretty cool articles online about therapeutically inducing hypothermia in patients and then reacting to the decrease in potassium. So giving them back more potassium through an IV line. And then when you pull them out of the hypothermia state and rewarm them, well, now you're dealing with the opposite problem. Now all that potassium that was intracellular is now coming out back into the serum again. And now you're, you're dealing with hyperkalemia. So that could be an issue. And then lastly, if you're interested, a link for EKG changes with hypo and hyperkalemia. Switching over to hyperkalemia, some common causes here. Addison's disease, which is a failure of the adrenal glands, and we get aldosterone from the adrenal glands. I just barely said in the previous slide that aldosterone promotes the excretion of potassium. So if we can't do that, we might get a buildup of potassium, hyperkalemia. How about diabetic keto? And here's the key, acidosis. Again, I said in the previous slide, alkalosis will cause uh, potassium to rush into the cell and an acidotic uh, state will cause potassium to rush out of the cells. Well, here's the thing. We've got most of our potassium in our cells. So this could potentially be a much larger flux than having an alkalotic problem. Another issue with diabetic ketoacidosis is that there isn't enough insulin in the body. And insulin helps potassium um, transfer into the cells. So that's just another nail in the coffin, right? Because that's inside the cells where all the potassium is. I keep saying it. And I mean it. Um, type 4 renal tubular acidosis. Well, hyperkalemia is one of the hallmarks of that type of RTA. So definitely there. Uh, head trauma, uh, metabolic acidosis, again, looking at an acidosis, tumor lysis syndrome. <laughs> Why? Why? Why tumor lysis syndrome? 
Well, I've hit it on the head a couple times because if a lot of cells start to break open or crack open, they're going to spill their contents. And again, inside the cell, that's where all the potassium is, so you might see the potassium spike. Next up is the first anion, chloride. So key points here, normal values between about 98 and 108 uh, millimoles per liter. And, you know, I didn't mention this earlier, but for every hospital or every clinic that you go to, the normal values for all your labs are going to be slightly different. So it's okay if your hospital tells you something other than 98 to 108. It's going to be about the same, but it doesn't have to be exact. Shifts in chloride are often associated with shifts in sodium. The two of these really like each other. Excessively low chloride is called hypochloremia, and excessively high chloride is called hyperchloremia. A few words on the physiology. Like I said, the two, chloride and sodium, usually follow each other. Chloride will also follow other strong cations, um, and this is because uh, the body has to maintain electron neutrality. So if we dumped a lot of cations but didn't dump associated anions, we would get an, a huge negative charge real quick. So you, you need to remember that for every negative that goes out, a positive has to go out as well. That's just the way it has to be. Chloride is transported via its own uh, specific co-transporters that move uh, a cation along with chloride. So that, that's how chloride gets uh, out of the body. Chloride is important for osmoregulation, extracellular fluid balance, just like sodium, and acid-base balance. Uh, what about this? What, what is the primary acid in your stomach? Well, it's hydrochloric acid, so you need chloride to digest your food, right? Um, for the common causes of abnormal values, you could have a hypochloremia if you have a hyponatremia. Makes sense. I've said it a couple times. They go together. Also, vomiting. Why? Because if you're losing a lot of acid, which is a big part of that, the hy uh, hydrochloric acid, well, then you're losing a lot of chloride. What about hyperchloremia? Again, if you see hypernatremia, you might see a hyperchloremia. Also, types 1 and 2, renal tubular acidosis, can cause hyperchloremia. And um, in the literature, you will see carbonic anhydrase inhibitors can also do that. Okay, next up is bicarb. This is the other anion. Key points here are that uh, normal values are between 22 and 29 millimoles per liter. Bicarb is very, very important for pH buffering. And... Any basic chemistry class will teach you about pH buffering, so I'm not going to cover that here. Excessively low bicarb is called, wait for it, what? That's it? Decreased bicarbonate? Yeah, it's, it's, it's about that simple. I, there, I've never called it anything other than low bicarb or high bicarb, and I can't see anyone else that uses any other uh, really cool terms. You could say that um, the person's more acidotic or they have an acidosis, but to be more specific, you should probably just say, uh, based on the BMP, I see a decreased bicarb. And if they ask you about acid base, of course, you could, you could uh, educate them. But anyway, excessively high bicarb is also interesting. And I would say elevated bicarb. Um, really important here though, if you've got significant acid base problems, the BMP just isn't going to cut it. You really should get an ABG or an arterial blood gas, which is an arterial lab that gives you much, much more information on acid base status. And uh, now into the physiology, just, just to touch on it, of bicarb. It's a base. We know that. We know that it's an important pH buffer. I just said that. But here's the stoichiometric uh, or the stoichiometry of how it does its buffering. Carbon dioxide and water, um, as in the carbon dioxide that you produce for metabolism and water, um, react to make uh, carbonic acid, which goes back and forth depending on the pH between uh, uh, its acid form and its, its uh, base form, which would be carbonic acid and uh, bicarbonate. Okay, so this, this is where the magic happens right here. Um, and again, check out this video on ABG if you need it. 
Common causes of low bicarbonate would be uh, Addison's disease could do that. We've talked a little bit about Addison's disease. Um, ethylene glycol poisoning, this is kind of something that you'll see on your, uh, on your boards, important there. Ketoacidosis, I believe we already talked about that. Various kidney diseases can do it. Again, lactic acidosis, metabolic acidosis in all its forms. Methanol poisoning, poisoning again, might be good for your boards. And salicylate toxicity. As for increased bicarb levels, well, uh, what about vomiting? Well, in vomiting, you're, you're getting rid of a lot of acid, which would increase the pH and push you over to a more, more basic uh, internal pH. Uh, various metabolic alkaloses could do this. COPD, which would be like a chronic problem. This would be from the uh, metabolic compensation. And then uh, con syndrome. So in the low bicarb, just the previous slide, I said Addison's disease. What is Addison's disease? Well, Addison's disease is the failure to produce aldosterone. What is Kahn's syndrome? Well, Kahn's syndrome is hyperaldosteronism. So those two are kind of opposite of each other. So yeah, the one would be low bicarb and then this one would be high bicarb. Okay, guys, you just finished the first half of a two-part series on the BMP. I really hope you liked it. If you did, please give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. Leave us a comment. We love hearing from you. Also, go check out metamersion.com. And hey, you're awesome. You can do it. Hang in there and good luck.